Okay, we're ready. Okay, thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sherry Seriano, and I'm delighted to be here tonight to talk to you about mushrooms. Um, before I get started in the presentation, I'm just going to quickly review Cooperative Extension um, and our structure for those of you who aren't familiar with it. Rutgers Cooperative Extension is a partnership between the Board of County Commissioners, Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey, and USDA's National Institute of Food and Agriculture. And uh, we have faculty, our combined departments has, have faculty and or staff in 20 of the 21 New Jersey counties. There's actually three departments um, in, our, in Rutgers Cooperative Extension. There's agriculture and natural resources, 4-H Youth Development, and my department, which is Family and Community Health Sciences. We're more commonly known as FCHS, just shorter and uh, easier to say. So FCHS, we provide outreach in New Jersey and beyond on topics related to nutrition, chronic disease prevention, food safety, and overall wellness. And uh, we'd love for you to visit our website for nutrition and wellness related resources and follow us on social media. I'm actually a um, educator for the department in Warren County. My offices are at the Wayne Dumont Administration Building. And um, we are currently, um, we currently are allowing people into the office on a uh, one by one basis. Um, but basically, I am a county educator, and I've been with Rutgers Cooperative Extension for about 16 years now. Um, so, and I'm a registered dietitian. My prior um, positions have been as an oncology dietitian, which is where I got my interest in chronic disease prevention and in functional foods. So I'd like to, again, welcome you to this uh, presentation. This is the fourth revision of this functional foods program, uh, focus on fungi, mushrooms, and their health benefits. So what is a functional food? Well, it's one that has a potentially beneficial effect on health when it's consumed on a regular basis and at certain levels. So that's a definition, but there isn't really a like a um, USDA or FDA uh, definition for functional foods. Functional foods are, the wording is used very frequently in, in um, research writings, in um, language that those who study food um, re very regularly use. I just want you to know that it's not like an official uh, definition by a government body of any type. And we could say that all foods on some level are considered functional and there's substances in food other than well-known nutrients like vitamins and minerals in some foods that may provide health benefits. And we consider foods with these potential health benefits to be known as functional foods. So this series is all about um, whole foods or beverages that have been shown through research to provide possible health benefits. And as you'll see, mushrooms fit nicely into that category. So I'm gonna chat with you about mushrooms in a couple different ways. Um, we'll define them a little bit more. We'll talk a little history, a little bit about processing and preparing them. And then, of course, I'm going to talk about the research and the possible health benefits of mushrooms, as well as the important part of how to include them in a healthful plant-based diet. So let's start with some, just some basics. Um, here we have a basic looking mushroom, and I'm sure you all know that the cap is at the top of the mushroom. And then that long um, piece, which we might call the stem of the mushroom, is called the stipe. Underneath the cap are the gills. They're under, on the underside, and they're responsible for the production of mushroom spores. The ring is the tissue covering the immature fungi, fungi and is what remains as the mushroom grows and it leaves remnants of the ring on the stipe or the cap. So again, this is a, this is a typical mushroom. This is like if, uh, a white button mushroom. There are many types of mushrooms and we'll talk about some of those as well. 
and a little bit more about definition. So mycology is the study of mushrooms and other fungi. So a mycologist is one who studies mushrooms. Fungi re reproduce from spores. So it's important to know if you didn't already that they're not a plant. They don't have chlorophyll that's in plants and seeds. And they're the fruit of an organism which grows either in the ground or on something that's living or dead. In fact, fungus need organic matter that's made from living things to grow. They can't use photosynthesis the way that plants do, and they're ultimately reliant on plants for food. Their actual definition is that they are the fruiting body of a macro fungus, which is, means macro fungus means it's a large fungus, one that's large enough to be seen by the human eye. So in other words, they're very unique and they do very unique, unique things and they play really important role, roles in our lives, not just one, but many important roles in our lives. Some will go as far to say, uh, as far to say, some mycologists, that they affect every facet of human life. So here are some of the roles that they play. They take carbon and nitrogen from the air and they store carbon as well in mineral products. They form and maintain the structure and fertility of soils. They recycle nutrients from vegetable residue. They enhance plant productivity and the exchange of nutrients from plant to plant. Of course, they serve as a food source for humans as well as for mammals and some invertebrates. They regulate plant and insect populations and they do so much that a popular mycologist has said, have you thanked a fungus today? So we haven't always known about mushrooms or when the first time um, a individual um, learned about, about was eating mushrooms or how long ago were people actually um, either eating them or using them for something. So we found, um, according to a book called In the Company of Mushrooms, a biologist's tale by Elio Schechter, he says that mushrooms were used in some way as early as over 5,000 years ago. And that's because of a discovery that occurred only in 1991. And it was of a Stone Age man in the Alps. He was found frozen and mummified. And he was um, found by hikers near the Italian-Austrian border. And there were remnants of tissue from certain types of fungi on this person or on his mummified body. One of the types of mushrooms was used as tinder. They know that it was, that mushroom was not used as food necessarily, but they used it to make fire. And it is speculated, they don't know, but it's speculated that the other two types of fungi may have been used for medicinal purposes. What this shows is that different types of mushrooms were used in this Stone Age society. There's also evidence that mushrooms were used by ancient societies in religious ceremonies in the areas of Mexico, Siberia, and New Guinea. And moving on in um, time, there were writings uh, by the Greeks in the fifth century BC regarding fungi that came from important people uh, like Hippocrates and Euripides and they were referring to mushroom poisonings. So they discovered that there could be an issue with eating mushrooms. The Greeks and the Romans also wrote of the joys as well as the dangers of eating mushrooms. And they were also um, writing about how they were confused as to how they originated. It became obvious that there weren't seeds. So how were they, how, how were they happening? And they talked about them possibly being ferments of the earth or products of thunder of all things. And they were later referred to as delicacies in European cookbooks in the Middle Ages. 
the actual study, like the modern study of mushrooms in a botanical way, wasn't really occurring until the time of the Renaissance. So it's been a slow, long process. But as time went on in the 17th and 18th centuries, a man by the name of Pietro Antonio Michele of Florence worked to prove that fungi develop from spores. So um, I guess that wasn't really that long ago, and I'm sure that wasn't an easy thing to do, but it was an important observation and it moved the study of mushrooms forward. Before that time, as I mentioned, there were you know, interesting theories about thunder and did they generate spontaneously, things like that. But after that, you know, it was understood, spores, that's, what, that's where they came from. In the 19th century, Elias Fries compiled and organized a system to classify mushrooms and it's been used the same system up to present time. I think that's very impressive. Throughout most of time, humans obviously have been collecting and eating wild mushrooms with many good results, because when they're good, they're good, but unfortunately, some not so good results. Now, I have a little story for you. In 1767, this is a true story, um, in 1767, Johann Schobert, he was a gifted composer, and he was a famous organist and harpsichordist at the court of Versailles. He picked wild mushrooms with his family outside of Paris. And when he brought them back to his home, um, he was told by his chefs that mushrooms, the ones he picked, were poisonous. But they did not listen and they prepared a soup with them anyway and ate it. And the entire family, except for one child, died. So that may sound a little dramatic, but it's a lead in to my safety <laughs> caution slide that says mushrooms should be identified with 100% certainty before eating. So mushroom collecting, it is very popular. A lot of people like to do this and not just all over the world, but in this country as well. And it shouldn't be taken lightly at all because some mushrooms, I'm sure you all know that mushrooms can be toxic, but I want to make sure that everybody knows that some mushrooms that resemble those that we eat are toxic. They look very close to the ones that we eat. And that's sometimes where people make mistakes. So if you obtain mushrooms um, yourself, or if you buy them from a vendor, make sure it's a re reliable vendor who has verified um, that they know what they're talking about. So enough said, be careful with mushrooms. So a little bit about classifying mushrooms. There's many classifications and I'm gonna talk about the um, most popular classifications. There are estimated to be 140,000 mushroom species out there and only 10% are known. And of them, 14,000 uh, of the known named species, about half are thought to be edible and 700 are thought to have potential significant medicinal properties. So there's still a lot of work to do um, researching them. The two major groups you see here are Ascomycetes and Basidiomycetes. And again, this is kind of basic information regarding mushroom classification. The Ascomycetes are differentiated from the Basidiomycetes by the location of their spore production. So in the Ascomycetes, they are the spores are produced inside a microscopic sausage-shaped organ that's inside the mushroom. And in the Basidiomycetes, the spores are produced outside um, the, a microscopic club-shaped reproductive organ. So the popular types of Ascomycetes mushrooms you see here are morels and truffles, and of the Basidiomycetes are agarics and chanterelles. The agarics are more commonly known as like white button mushrooms, portobello, and criminy mushrooms. They're very popular in the country and they've been cultivated, white button ones anyway, have been cultivated since the 18th century. 
criminy um, are very similar. If you've tasted them, they sort of look a little bit like just darker button mushrooms, but they have a richer um, taste and kind of a firmer texture. And portobello mushrooms are, of course, much larger. They're a relative of the white and criminy mushrooms, and they can be up to six inches in diameter. And of course, they're very, very deep flavor, very meat-like uh, flavor and texture. Other popular mushrooms um, in the United States are the shiitake and the maitake. Shiitake you see here, they look like a typical mushroom um, with that cap and they have a curved stem which is recommended to remove. It can be very, it can be very tough. The maitake is such an interesting looking mushroom. It's very different in appearing as this really cool rippling fan shaped structure. It doesn't have caps and it's one of the largest fungi weighing, it can weigh up to 25 pounds and it kind of looks like a little bush and is also known as hen of the woods. I'm going to talk about other mushrooms throughout um, the presentation, but I wanted to mention truffles. So um, if you'd like to, you don't have to, but if you'd like to, you can mention it, whether or not you've ever had something to eat that has actual truffle in it. I think a lot of truffle oil is used in food these days in restaurants and some people even have some in their homes, but I'm curious to know if anybody has eaten anything that has actual truffles in it. So they are an Ascomycetes type of mushroom that is sought after for its unique uh, delicious taste. As you may know, they can sell for thousands of dollars per pound. So if you don't know why they are so expensive, it's, there's a lot of reasons. First of all, they're hard to grow. Um, they're difficult to find. And once they're found, they don't last for very long, only about seven to 10 days. They grow primarily under trees and they're generally not cultivated. They um, train dogs these days to find truffles in the, um, in the past, pigs were trained, female pigs were trained, were not trained, were used because um, interestingly enough, the smell of truffles is similar to the scent of a male pig. So they didn't have to train the females, they could just find them. The dogs though, as I said, are trained. The most popular types of truffles are the white. Um, primarily the white are found in Northern Italy and the black are found in France. So, um, but although they're, you know, they, they can both, both types could be found in each country. And I just quickly want to mention that for the first time when I was taking a look at this revision, I found that truffles are starting to be cultivated in the United States, particularly in California. They're experimenting with it. So I think that there may come a day where we will have them in the, in the country and hopefully the price goes down dramatically. So a little bit about the taste of mushrooms. We're all very familiar with the four basic tastes of, of sweet, salty, bitter, and sour. But there's also the fifth taste, umami. It's derived from the Japanese word umai, and that means delicious. It also means savory, brothy, or meaty, which is how mushroom taste is often described as well. And chefs and foodies all feel that this taste of umami, it completes the balance of flavors in food. And obviously mushrooms are an example of this. The darker the mushroom, the more umami it contains. So for example, the shiitake and the portobellas, morels and porcini and, and dried mushrooms, and the more they're cooked, the more umami they have. And they have much more than fresh ones. So the, um, I wanted to share that there are some cheeses, some cured meats and even fermented products that have that taste of umami. Um, think of things like soy sauce and sauerkraut also have a taste of umami.
If you have never seen this, um, mushrooms are grown in something, first of all, they're grown year round in the dark um, and they're grown in a, an environment that's very carefully controlled. They're grown in a substrate, not in soil like plants, but a, an organic material that provides the perfect nutritional balance for the mushrooms to grow in. And to start the mushrooms, the um, company that's growing them, they purchase something called spawn that's purchased from a commercial lab. They mix it into that substrate and then they place them in the trays for growing. They put a peat moss type mix, which is known as a casing over top of the mixture. And that helps to hold in the moisture. The first sight of a mushroom pushing up through the casing is called the pinning stage. And that's what you see in the top photo. You see just the little buds, I'll call them, popping up um, into, into the casing. And soon after, they're, they're done. They, they only, um, their cycle is only about 16 to 35 days and, and they're harvested all by hand. So wonder they're not more expensive that they have to all be harvested by hand. Um, when you're handling mushrooms and choosing them, you wanna choose those that do not have any, any moisture shown on the packaging at all or on the mushrooms. They should look dry when you look in the package or if you're, if you're actually holding them. They of course shouldn't look dried out though, just dry. They should be stored in the original package or a paper bag. Uh, in the refrigerator for about probably no more than a week. And you can freeze sauteed mushrooms, but not fresh ones. They will just uh, fall apart. The sauteed ones will hold up for you for, uh, for a little while, about a month or so. Cleaning them is always um, a curious thing. There are a lot of different ideas for cleaning mushrooms. Um, I feel comfortable with cleaning them with a soft brush or quickly rinsing them. You don't ever want to add too much water to them. They'll just soak it in and become tough. You want to always wash them or clean them right before you're going to use them. Don't ever wash them and put them away because unfortunately they will go bad very quickly. And there's so many ways to prepare them. Um, obviously sauteing is very popular grilling portobello mushrooms like you see here in this photo um, to make something like a portobello burger is uh, very, very popular. You can even uh, microwave them. I've never done it, but apparently you can put them in the microwave for about six minutes with a little flavoring and some, a little bit of uh, moisture and um, something, uh, six minutes would be a large portobello cap, not not um, cut up mushrooms, that wouldn't take long at all. Um, and you can roast them. I think roasting is probably the easiest of all these. You, you can chop them up or you can use whole caps, uh, maybe add just a little bit of oil and some, some of your favorite flavors, some of your favorite herbs on top and high temperature like 400 to 450, 415 to 20 minutes and um, they'll smell delicious and they'll taste delicious too. So the interest in mushrooms is growing and continues to grow. It's been growing over the past 30 to 40 years, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, growing annually about 5 to 7% since 1980. Every year, more and more people are interested in them. So they are being grown globally right now. A large majority of the world's commercial mushrooms come from China and about 25% from the European Union. The U.S. supplies a small amount with Japan, Indonesia, and Canada. They supply an even smaller amount, only about 1%. The largest exporter of fresh uh, mushrooms to the U.S. is Canada. They export 79% um, to the US and Mexico has, is a very distant second place. In the US, uh, mushrooms are grown in almost every state, but Pennsylvania has historically and continues to be the top 
producer. It's 60% of US production. And California has the highest amount of sales in the, um, in the country and the highest growth rate. They're just growing um, dramatically. They've overtaken other produce um, such as tomatoes and peppers that, that New Jersey used to be the higher, uh, used to have higher production rates of, and California has taken over um, those numbers and they're in, in the top um, tier of that, of those sales uh, at this time. So I wonder if they're going to do the same with mushrooms. I hope not. I do love that Pennsylvania does that has always been a top producer. So here's an interesting thought um, that fungi are not plants. So where are they as far as a kingdom? Um, we have the plant kingdom, we have the animal kingdom, and we just kind of stick mushrooms in there. Um, they're not really meant to be there. They don't have the same characteristics. And so some mycologists feel that they should have their own kingdom. So as we mentioned before, they don't have chlorophyll. They don't, um, they can't do photosynthesis. They live on decaying material. They don't have cellulose in them, um, the type of fiber found in plant foods. They have fiber it's called chitin and it's a very unique fiber. It's insoluble and it's not found in plants. Um, it's in mushrooms and it's also in the exoskeleton of insects and crustaceans. So that makes them incredibly unique as well. They also don't have cholesterol like uh, animal products do, but they have a sterile that's known as ergosterol. So there are many unique qualities and someday maybe they'll have their own food king, their own kingdom. How about the nutritional value of mushrooms? I have to admit for a long time, I felt that they probably didn't have much. It doesn't, they don't feel like they have a lot when you eat them necessarily, but they actually have a great nutrient profile. Um, they are a low calorie, low fat food. Um, they do have vitamin B12. They don't have a lot in there. So vegetarians or vegans can't use it as their B12 source, but there is some in there and it's a good way for them to get B12 in. Um, I list there some of the other good sources and it's an excellent source, uh, mushrooms of riboflavin. The really interesting nutritional um, value of mushrooms could be vitamin D. And I say could be, um, I'll explain in a minute. Um, but first, vitamin D is, is very important. There are new reasons why we need to make sure we are um, not deficient in vitamin D every day. Um, or, that's an exaggeration. There are constantly new, uh, is constantly new research coming out that shows us how important the role is. And unfortunately, um, we are as a country and as a, as a global people, very deficient in vitamin D, especially those who live in areas such as the Northeast, where we are kind of um, lathering on sunscreen all summer, um, covering up our skin so we're not getting vitamin D from the sun. And all winter, we're all covered up with um, parkas and mittens and stuff and can't get any vitamin D in the winter either. So if you haven't had your vitamin D checked, I'll just put in a little commercial here to say, check your, check your vitamin D and see where you're at with it and see if you need to be um, by your doctor, check and see if you need to be supplementing. So anyway, um, there, are, there are many reasons why they're important and mushroom, mushrooms have vitamin D in them, but they could have even more if they were exposed to UV light. Not a lot of UV light, just a little bit increases their amount of vitamin D um, content. So uh, for example, um, a serving of raw portobello mushrooms Exposed to UV light can have will have 446 
I use international units of vitamin D. Without the UV exposure, they only have 10 IUs. So that is quite, an, quite a dramatic increase. And most of our mushrooms are cultivated and they're grown in the dark. So they would have to add this process into the growing um, to contribute to um, their increase in vitamin D. And some mushroom farmers are starting to do this in the United States, um, in Ireland, and the Netherlands, and in Australia. They're initiating the practice of exposing them, uh, and they're looking into it to see how it works with fresh mushrooms and also with dried mushrooms. So you may be seeing this in the future. Uh, this is a great option for vegans and vegetarians by giving them a non-animal source to obtain vitamin D. There's also an amino acid in uh, mushrooms called ergothionine. It's an essential amino acid. And what that means is that we need to get this from food. Our bodies can't make it, we need to consume it. And there's not a lot of sources of it. Uh, there are a few, black and red beans, for example, oat bran, kidney and liver, are um, op options and mushrooms are as well. They're actually a really good source of ergothionine and oyster mushrooms, which you see in the picture here, um, as well as maitake and shiitake. Uh, shiitake mushrooms um, contain some of the highest amounts of the ergothionine. Um, they also have antioxidant activity, which makes them uh, very helpful in that role as well. Mushrooms do have fiber in them. And you can see here, there's a varying amount. Um, there, some are a little on the low side. Shiitake mushrooms are close to what, um, like a half a cup to a cup of berries would have. So it's a, it's, a um, it's not a negligible amount. All right, so a little bit about the possible health benefits of mushrooms. At first glance, you would imagine that the possible health benefits uh, could be very numerous. And over the years, mushrooms have actually been attributed to producing more than 100 medicinal functions, such as antioxidant and antiviral activities, and have been thought to potentially protect against cancer, diabetes, heart disease, allergies, cognition, weight management, and oral health. That's a lot, um, and all are being studied. A lot of the studies, um, almost all studies on foods, they start with, they start first of all as an in vitro study, meaning it's in a Petri dish or in a um, test tube, and they start there and then they see what happens from there. And they often start with like parts of a mushroom. So they're not actually testing on a mushroom, they're taking out some piece of it. For example, something like the ergothionine is an example of something they pull out. Or we'll see that they take out uh, beta-glucan, which is a type of fiber that's in mushrooms. They study those to see what their benefits are before they actually start to um, study on populations and with people. So what about cancer? Many of you probably know that mushrooms have been used for medicinal purposes for hundreds of years, particularly in Asian countries. Medicinal mushrooms have been recognized in China, Japan, and Malaysia for over 2,000 years for medicinal purposes. There are written records of use of shiitake mushrooms for medicinal use in Japan as early as 199 AD. And studying them and their role in cancer prevention started in part when it was shown that mushroom farmers did not have the same rate of cancer deaths as other people. Interesting reason. But usually, as I mentioned, isolated compounds of foods are studied first. And specific compounds in mushrooms are being formally studied to determine their potential benefits. Um, <clears throat> certain mushrooms, such as raishi, which is also known as Ganoderma 
shiitake and maitake have been used for the prevention of cancer and as well during cancer treatments. They've been used alone and in conjunction with chemotherapy and radiation therapy in Asia. It's been found, um, this practice has definitely been found to increase the likelihood of cancer cell death and decreasing the sp spread of cancer cells in Asia. A significant substance found in mushrooms that's been studied is um, the beta-glucans I was mentioning just a minute ago. It's a type of fat fiber. It's also found in oats and barley, seaweed and algae. And they, they're well known for their ability to contribute to our immune function, which can in turn lead to cancer prevention and suppression. There are promising studies um, along this line However, I have to give you the whole story and somewhat recently two really large population studies in the United States. One is the Nurses Health Study, which with over 68,000 women, and the other is the Health Professionals Follow-Up Study with over 44,000 men. They found no association when they looked at the dietary um, recalls of those who were in these studies between mushroom consumption and total and site-specific cancers in the U.S., although they agree that more research is needed in this area. A similar story um, with diabetes and heart disease early on and, you know, and still there are studies that are showing the lowering of fasting blood glucose and serum insulin levels which in turn can protect against type 2 diabetes, and they've shown um, a decrease in the levels of total and HDL cholesterol and triglycerides and increased HDL, which we know is a good thing. And that all, you know, summed up would show the protection against heart disease. It's also been reported that these possible benefits are um, attributed to those beta-glucans again. That's what has been studied that has shown that. And have gone, the studies have gone as far as showing um, prevention of weight gain and metabolic syndrome. And metabolic syndrome is a direct line to the increased risk of diabetes, um, type 2 diabetes and heart disease. So the same thing has happened where looking at the review of the nurses' health study and the health professionals' follow-up study has found no association between mushroom intake and type 2 diabetes and heart disease. Um, they, again, recommend that more studies are needed specifically with other racial and ethnic groups. So, what we're hearing here are two different stories that time will tell what, you know, what the true answer is. More research needs to be done. And so many look promising that this is, this was very disappointing. Um, this is the first time I've had to uh, report that when I talk about mushrooms um, in 15 years. So I think we need to stay tuned. The other possible health benefits um, with neurodegenerative diseases, for example, is preliminary at this time, but um, they are looking at the effect of a certain form of vitamin D, as known as ergocalciferol, on actions in the brain that um, we know lead to dementia and Alzheimer's disease. That's what they are looking at and trying to um, determine. Um, there are um, mushrooms known as lion's mane that are, that, is be, that are being studied as well and being used um, for this purpose. And mushrooms have been associated with maintenance of a good bacteria in our gut. So being used as a prebiotic and as a laxative as well. And that is with positive results. Another area of study which has been very positive is providing um, a feeling of satiety, which means like a feeling of fullness, which leads to weight management. And this can be due to the fiber content. Um, they've also done, uh, many studies have looked at substituting 
mushrooms, meaty mushrooms, the ones we spoke about, like portobello mushrooms for high fat meats. And many did not notice that it, they were lower in calories, lower in saturated fat, and they were satisfied with the meal without increasing um, calorie intake. And what that may benefit is hypertension, lipid levels again, and inflammatory markers, which indicate um, inflammation in the body is not a good thing. So we don't, um, we don't want them that can lead to disease. And then of course, there are antioxidants um, in, the, in mushrooms, besides what we've spoken out our, about already, the main ones are phenolics and carotenoids and even vitamin C or ascorbic acid. And because they're in there, antioxidants we know help guard our cells from damage that can lead to disease. And, um, and that is always a good thing. More studies on all of these are needed, but these, um, these pieces are, are feeling a little more stable than some of the other areas that I spoke about earlier. So what's the bottom line or the recommendation is that continue to eat mushrooms if you, if you like them. They're certainly a nutritious choice. Um, and I encourage you to enjoy a variety of them, if, especially if you've only uh, really gotten into the white button mushrooms so far. You want to try um, lots of different types um, from the store. I noticed that farmers markets are, are carrying mushrooms. Um, they're growing mushrooms safely. Um, not talking about picking them, not that I'm aware of anyway. They're selling them and a lot of interesting types um, that I, I actually have never seen in person in stores. I'm seeing them at farmers markets. You can definitely include mushrooms as part of a healthful plant-based diet. They are definitely packed with vitamins, minerals, um, antioxidants, and they have fiber. And um, stay tuned for the whole vitamin D story as well. And uh, think about enhancing uh, your meatless meals if you have them with mushrooms or um, consider adding them to, to your meals, um, soups, um, casseroles and roasting them and adding them to all of your favorite dishes. If you'd love to learn more about mushrooms, there's a great website called the Mushroom Council that has really a, a wealth of information and recipes. Um, the Amer American Institute for Cancer Research has um, many mushroom recipes as well. If you're really into it, you can look at the uh, field guide to mushrooms by Simon & Schuster's. And um, there's a great book, Biodiversity of Fun Fungi, Their Role in Human Life, which is very interesting. And for the true mushroom lover, if you haven't already been, you must at some point in your life um, attend the Mushroom Festival in Kennett Square. It's uh, a lot of fun and um, you will get your fill of mushrooms there for sure. As I mentioned earlier, um, there are six programs in this, um, or presentations in this series, and I am updating all of them this year. I have updated all of them at this point, um, except for one, uh, the one on coffee, and have presented all of them. Uh, my goal was to update all of them this year and present all of them um, and have them available to the public. Uh, this is being recorded, so it can be shared. It will be shared on the library's site um, and feel free to watch it again or share it with people that you know if they're interested in learning more about mushrooms too. And um, before we um, head out, we have a uh, short poll that um, we're going to put up on the screen. I am, um, I do work for Rutgers University and it helps us and it helps the university understand what is um, the demographics of the individuals we are teaching, and it's necessary for me to show um, what I'm teaching and how effective it is. So if you wouldn't mind taking just a moment to do this poll, there's just a few questions here, I would greatly appreciate it. Um, and um, when we're done, uh, that, if there are any questions, uh, be happy to take them. Feel free to put them in the chat. And thank you very much for your attention.
just wait a few more minutes. I see that a lot of people are answering the poll and I do appreciate it. And I'm just taking a look at the, uh, if there's any questions. I have a question. Um, is now a good time? Yes. Yeah, go oh. ahead. Um, how often, to get the benefits of mushrooms, how often should you consume them? And is it better to eat them raw or cooked? And what kind of volume? That I don't have definites on those. They have not come out with any recommendations along those lines. But I would say that Eating a variety of them is what's important. I'm a variety of all fruits, be vegetables, whole grains, uh, legumes, variety is really um, the key because we get such a wide variety of nutrients from all of those different places that we want to make sure we're getting that wide variety. Um, I like to mention people who eat the same fruit every day, for example, like every day they have a banana for lunch, they have um, blueberries on their cereal, and they eat green beans for dinner. Like, I, I think that's great that they're eating fruits and vegetables, of course, but the variety is not there. And that's, that's what's important. The specifics, unfortunately, we don't have, we definitely don't have that. We're not there at all with how much we need. Um, and because it's not a plant food, like we can say adults need one and a half to two cups of fruit a day, things like that, because we've, it's been studied. Mushrooms have not been studied enough to know anything like that. And I'm hesitant to lump them in with a plant food um, in that way. So I'm sorry, I can't give you more specifics, but does that help at all? Uh, yeah, I just, I, do like them a lot so I'm going to try to eat more but um did you happen to know about cooked or raw oh cooked or raw um I think that um some when when they're cooked especially with just a small amount of oil I say that because there's beta carotene in them and it's a it's a fat soluble um substance that is better consumed when there's a little bit of fat involved in eating them. It doesn't have to be with the mushrooms, but just in what you're eating, it's it would be helpful. Well, that's uh, never a problem for me. I'm sorry? That's never a problem for me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your question. I'm going to go back to the um, chat and see if there's any here. The best source for checking to see if a mushroom is poisonous is to ask somebody who is an expert, not using a field guide or anything because I mentioned that some look very similar. Um, I more than anything don't want to hear that anybody has listened to this and gone out and started picking mushrooms and eating them. Please don't. Um, we have a great recommendation here that of someone who grinds up mushrooms in ground beef to make burgers and um, shiitake and lion's mane in the beef tonight. That's great. And that's a great way to kind of um, make them feel full to add some fiber to the actually to the burgers. That's a great idea. And also another um, suggestion that Blairstown Farmer's Market has mushrooms, many types. Um, so does the Easton, Easton Farmer's Market. Excellent. Thanks for letting us know. The one where um, I've seen them is in Emmaus, which is in Pennsylvania. Um, let's see. There's also a Scotch Plain Farmer's Market suggestion. If you have puffball mushrooms in your yard, I do not believe they are safe to cook and eat. Um, what mushroom variety is the most healthy? Um, I don't, I don't think there is a most healthy. It's, you know, it's, there are a lot of lists out for vegetables 
in, in that way too, where they'll put one at the top of the list, but it changes all of the time. And that's because it depends on what your what you what that individual who's writing that list thinks is most important. Um, we could look at all of the different nutrients that are in mushrooms or in any vegetable or, or fruit. And for some reason, they may be at the top of the list um, some of the time and others. I think they're I think that I would probably not be wrong in saying that the basic button mushrooms, because of um, their light color, may not be highest in nutrient value. But the others, I, I don't know which is the most healthy. Again, variety is your key. I do. Here's a good question. Do animals know which mushrooms are poisonous? And what is the dark powdery mist that disperses from a dead mushroom? I don't know the answer to that one um, at all. And I, I sense that um, animals do know which mushrooms are poisonous because they are, they, it's passed down somehow through, through their, um, they kind of inherit the, the knowledge, I imagine. Um, do canned mushrooms have health benefits? Um, sure, they do. They're kind of like, um, I'm going to say any canned vegetable where it, they decrease somewhat in quality and in quality of, um, of nutrients. But if that's the best way for you to get mushrooms in, then, I, then it's an okay choice. Just like it's an okay choice to have frozen, um, fresh, dried, um, canned vegetables and fruits, same thing with, I would say the same thing with mushrooms. And that, they, that is all that I see here. Um, I want to thank you so very much for your attention and for your great questions. Um, I hope you enjoyed this and um, I hope you have a great evening. Thank you so much.